All right, before I bring our keynote speaker, Al, who I had the great opportunity to interview on the show today, he, uh, what an inspirational man. He's a great speaker. You're absolutely going to love what he has to share with you this evening. Uh, we're going to jump right in with a trip down memory lane, as I mentioned earlier. I'm going to take you back to a time before many of you in this room even heard of Live Work Life. Some of you, I'm embarrassed to say, probably weren't even born yet. That's how old Keenan and I are, and Julie, and the rest of the game. Some of you may know the story, and others may not, but let's go back to the beginning and answer the question, how did Live Work Play get started? You all know the organization was started by Julie Kingstone, and Keenan Weller, who serve as co-leaders of Live, Work, Play. But how exactly and why exactly did that happen? I'll start with a brief video explanation of what is commonly known as the Keenan Confusion. <laughs> okay, I'm <laughs> uh, I'm pleased to hear uh, Laurie's comments, because following Laurie, I was quite intimidated that perhaps my comments would not align with yours. Not a good place to be. But I think I think they do, and if I may be so bold, kind of the opposite side of a, a similar coin, which is uh, my own personal stake in this. So I don't have a disability or disability label. So why why am I here? And believe me, I'm I'm honored to be included in this community because uh, it's actually kind of a, a unique space. And uh, how I got here, basically in 1989. Through sheer happenstance, I actually misread the wording on a job application. I did not know that the developmental challenge had to do with disabilities, um, apparently. It was actually my thinking that this was about uh, perhaps people from uh, economically disadvantaged homes. And I had some experience working in that community, so I applied for a position. And it was actually for working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And as they proceeded through the job interview, and I realized I had no idea what they were talking about, uh, and I got the job that way, uh, it struck me that for 21 years of my life in this community, for some reason, I had never met a person with Down syndrome. I had never met a person with autism. I had never met a person with cerebral palsy. And I was really angry and offended, and I was asking, really ignorant, probing questions like, where have they been? Why has this happened? Uh, well, I went all through a school system that segregated all those individuals somewhere else. I didn't see them, and they didn't see me. I was living my life uh, in university and in the community. Once again, there's another a special place where they go, and I don't see them, and they don't see me. The same as in my workplaces. Uh, nobody there. So this really uh, bothered me and struck me and stuck with me, even as I went on to a career for a little while in the high tech industry. Um, I felt that my soul was fading away and uh, kind of went back to this thought of maybe there's something I could do to make a difference. And so how this relates to the theme is that uh, I see all this uh, separation and segregation. That is born out of the, the charity model thinking. Not, it's not a mean spirit in thinking. It's, a, it's an outdated thinking of people of difference uh, being better off, you know, separate, segregated, uh, protected. And so, uh, as Murray was saying, as we, you know, move into the new way of thinking and doing, and people like Lori and others driving that experience, but also there's a responsibility to the rest of the community, including fundraisers, that the way we talk and act uh, is at the very least uh, asking questions and being welcoming and being inclusive. Um, and not making assumptions on behalf of other people based on uh, difference in labels. And so that's kind of how I, I look at the two, uh, two models. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, Keenan, we're certainly glad you made that mistake. And, and we forgive you. Uh, and you know, what Keenan says is, Absolutely true, and I think if we all go back, those of us that didn't see that community that, that Keenan is talking about, that segregated community, we can all put ourselves in that same position. You know, growing up, if we, where were all these people? And I, I am so glad that Keenan and Julie, and it, they're, they're only two people. There's so many people that have come together over these 20 years that have made an incredible difference, and we're going to continue on. And, 
walk down memory lane and talk about one of those other incredible people. Julie took a different path. Working her way up from a junior staff at Christie Lake Camp with one of her first mentors, Dr. Dan Olfer. Although not focused specifically on the lives of children and youth with intellectual disabilities, Dr. Olfer understood and championed the evidence-based belief in the importance of leveling the playing field for individuals who have disadvantages in the race of life. This meant reducing and eliminating barriers rather than medicalizing children as problems to be corrected. In the meantime, Keenan's instincts about the importance of addressing the segregation of people from their own communities were reinforced by experiences with school boards, teacher education, and later as a project manager for a national special education initiative. These endeavors did not satisfy Keenan's need to address the need for a more inclusive community but the answer of how to do that continued to illuminate. Julie, too, was looking for answers and trying different paths on her life journey. She ran the gamut from youth mental health to palliative care and even a stint studying occupational therapy. It turns out this involves touching a lot of strangers. Not in that way. Not in that way. That's not where I'm going with this. And the idea was quickly abandoned for other pursuits. There remained a place in her heart for the type of fulfillment she experienced at Christie Lake. At this point, Keenan and Julie shared very little in common. And with the exception being a mutual friend, Ke Kevin Brown, and his future wife who are here tonight with us. I believe they are. Can they raise their hand? Thanks for being here. <laughs> no, you could be right. Uh, they ended up working together on small contracts with families and the Children's Aid Society supporting youth with intellectual disabilities to get out in the world and experience the Ottawa community. The pay was about $10 an hour split between two people and not including expenses. And there were a few times when they actually lost money on the day. But they enjoyed it and believed they were making a difference, just not enough of a difference to feel satisfied. In 1995, they applied for a small grant from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Their goals were modest, a telephone line, a computer, and small budget to host gatherings for individuals and families. When they had never heard back from the Trillium, from Trillium, they were disappointed and a little offended that they did not at least get that phone call to say that we have we've turned you down. They didn't get that rejection letter. Thankfully, they took it upon themselves to call Toronto and make inquiries. It turned out that the proposal was so strong, Trillium staff had set it aside so they could recommend they reapply and ask for more money. And so that's exactly what they did. Armed with three years of startup funding for what was at the time known as the Special Needs Network, the journey went public in 1997 with the opening of the first headquarters in an old classroom at the Bronson Center. There were about 11 people in attendance at those early meetings, but some of them, like Pat McBride and Elaine Murphy, well, they never left. With startup funding winding down, they worked to diversify sources, with, community found, with the Community Foundation of Ottawa Grants and Community Living Ontario, it takes a village project. Funding for the launch of SMILE, skills and more for independent living and employment, and they established the Network 303 Evening and Weekend Social Programs, along with the ACES and WOWEE Summer Program. I wish I was a part of that. I didn't call it WOWEE, it's right on my alley. Yes, the first five years involved a lot of acronyms. They love their acronyms. <laughs> it also involved some wonderful staff members and volunteers. Celebrated former staff from this area include Jesse Westman, Elaine Kerr, Ryan Charbonneau, and Jennifer Roberts. The list also includes current staff member Daniel Harris. 
Some of the early board members included Mark Schwartz, Holly Pierce, Christina Norris, Mary Stanfield, and Dave Kingstone. The willingness to take risks and try new things was exemplified in these early years through the establishment of the Bronson Community Thrift Center, which became known as the Busy Tizzy Second Hand Store. They love their funny names. The Wowee and the Busy Tizzy. While today, this might be heralded as an innovative social enterprise in practical terms, it was soon realized that people randomly dropping gar uh, uh, off garbage bags of used items required substantial resources with little guarantee of a return. Other innovative fundraisers of this time included participation in the Glee, Great Glee and Garage Sales, and also saw the introduction of the monthly family brunch events, a legacy that continues to this day with the family feast events in September, December, and March. The Harris family started the June pool party and barbecue that has also continued and has never been canceled in 17 years. It's the beauty of the pool party. Uh, Some of the most difficult days of live work play came in 1999. Our trillion grant was over, and thanks to issues with HRDC funding projects in eastern Canada. HRDC funding was frozen for the entire country, including Live, Work, Play. There were conversations about whether or not the organization could continue, and there was no money to pay salaries. The crisis ended, but as the first five years were coming to an end, big changes and lots of good news was just around the corner for 2000 to 2005. Now that we've gone back to the beginning and are just about to enter the new millennium, we'll pause here so I can introduce to you our keynote speaker. This author, speaker, teacher, and mentor is a leading voice for inclusive communities in 2015, but it's a message he has been covering for over 30 years. We all know that change is difficult, but social change takes a long time. With his relentless publishing, training, seminars, speaking engagement, and these days, even a series of YouTube videos, Al Condolucci is being heard around the world, and our communities are much better off for it. In fact, Al did not take a minute to rest today. He made use of his time in Ottawa for appearances on Rogers Daytime, which I hear is a pretty good show. <laughs> CFRA and CBC Radio, and in discussion with the Live, Work, Play staff team. Al Condolucci is CEO of Community Living and Support Services, also known as CLASS, a community-based support system in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He holds an MSW with PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, where he is on faculty in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences and the School of Social Work. He has authored seven books, including the brand new Macro Change Handbook. It's all about social capital. So please join me now in demonstrating our appreciation for Al coming all the way here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Carpellucci. Come on up here, Al. Thank you so much for having me.